Bonjour tout le monde. On autre mission, another one. This is one took me two days to read. So this is a uh, Genesis of the Grail Kings, Lawrence Gardner. So this was another one from uh, from a guy I look up to uh, gave me this book. Uh, this is the last one he gave me like this, and this is gonna be basically my last. Uh, sort of historical book I'm gonna really shift focus now I've gotten a lot done I'm excited about everything I learned so far I've kind of quelched that thirst for a lot of these things got a lot of things answered um, a question I didn't even know I had so without further ado here this was uh, 1999 let's see uh, and um, contents it got a uh, it's very well researched right the last uh, Let's look. 277 to, yeah, almost, you know, 50 or so pages, 60 pages of notes and bibliography and uh, charts of lineages. And, uh, yeah, some real good stuff there. So, jump in. It shouldn't be too long of a review here. Uh, it has cradle civilization, like migrating birds, crimson robes. Da -da -da. All right, so... The book really was changing in tone throughout throughout the chapters, and at some points I was like, "Oh God, I don't know where this is going." Oh Lord, and then it would switch to, "Oh, I wow, I didn't know he was going to say that. Or, I didn't know he felt that way. That, huh? I agree with that, you know." Um, so, yeah, with that, let's do it. A lot to learn, I guess. So, put a few stars. This first one. The Cradle of Civilization. So the first, like, I was like, what, really? He puts uh, Sumar, um, Sumer, however you say it, in the Mediterranean, um, or sorry, the Mes Mesopotamia. That's like the Cradle of Civilization. And he, like, moves everything from, like, uh, Egypt to focus on Mesopotamia as far as, like, uh, what's where everything originated, where it all started, right? So, I mean, I gave this one, like, quick read-through, so I wasn't really trying to accept everything I was reading. Therefore, I wasn't spending much time on his, uh, his quote, proof, because he wasn't really proving a lot. When I was first reading it, I was thinking, I just hear conclusions, but I don't hear the proof. I don't hear you proving this. Uh, referencing X, Y, Z, this text, this place, this this historian, this historian versus this historian versus this historian, none of that kind of stuff. No, like here's my process of drawing these conclusions. It was more like this is what happened, and then he would slowly give more references as he went along, and it was kind of like uh, because this is true, because I say this is true, then this is also true, and this is also true. And he would use different sources, but it wasn't like a a lot of scholars that I've read. They can prove a point, and they'll just give you a lot of stuff, and you wondering where they're going with it. And then they bring a conclusion at the end of all these findings, these objective truths. They'll bring all these objective truths, and then come to a conclusion that is then maybe debatable. But it's like based on all this research you provided in this context, I can see how you drew that conclusion. You know, that's that's more of a um, scholarly kind of approach, you know. But he was more like. Here's all the stuff I learned, and this is what I believe from what I've learned, you know? So it's kind of just, oh, and uh, from my reading of him on Wikipedia, uh, he was a, apparently like an inspiration for um, Dan Brown and his books and, you know, Angel and, Angels and Demons and Da Vinci Code and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. All right. So let's get into it. Enough of that. By 6000 BC, the people of the Mesopotamian Near East were using ships on the open sea, while Britain was still 4,000 years away from a simple weaving industry. I'm like, number one, BC, was there even a Britain? Um, well, that's like number two. And number one, um, where's this proof of these ships? Like you're saying this, but where is this ships? Um, most prominent stories of earthly beings emerged from the Bible lands of the Fertile Crescent most prominent stories of earthly beings okay now that's the claim there most prominent stories of earthly beings <laughs> emerged from the bible lands of the fertile crescent so that's his fertile crescent he puts in uh, mesopotamia 
above the Persian Gulf. He has a nice little picture in there. Anyway, um, keep going. It's really ain't gonna be that long. Uh, so Sum Sumer, Ur, Eridu, all these places I hadn't really heard of. Uh, let's see. Ever since Charles Darwin published his Descent of Man in 1871, a, dis a dispute has prevailed over whether humankind evolved by the gradual process of three millions of years or whether Adam and Eve were the first mortals created by God as told in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Now, uh, he continues to mention Descent of Man, 1871, as well as the other Charles Darwin book, uh, Nature of uh, Origin or uh, something. Uh, but he brings that one up too. And it just made me want to read that at some point. Um, let's see. Okay. In Christian church theology, Adam is generally dated at 4004 BC. And this has been the case since AD 1650 when Ireland's Protestant Archbishop James Usher, or, yeah, of Arg Armagh published his famous. Analyst Veteris Testamente. His method, of his method of calculation was straightforward, being based on the said ages of the early patriarchs when they fathered their respective sons. Um, so, yeah, that was just important um, because he was putting a date on Adam, 4004. Okay. Uh, let's see. And he does repeat some of these things throughout the book, too. So that was good. Um... The church approved universal history went so far as to say that God's work for creation actually began on 21 September 4004 BC. Now, at this point, early in the book, I'm thinking that he is uh, he's making a case of something. And, of course, immediately my first thought was, oh, he's making a case of, like, European um, origins of everybody. Like, lighter-skinned people were the first people or something. Like, that's what I was thinking that it had this kind of unspoken, which is usually how it is, um, Eurocentric sort of view, and that's what he was pushing. I say that's what I thought, because obviously I was surprised by the end, um, but I was pretty turned off at this point. I was already like uh, ready to get through it, but he writes really well. It's well written. Easy to just keep reading. And his breadth of knowledge is pretty immense because when I would see his little annotations, his little, you know, uh, notes, I would go to the back and then read those notes on those books. Like, what is he talking about? What does this come from? Like, he's referencing something, but what is he really referencing? And uh, uh, so, yeah, he did some good research. I mean, a lot of stuff I had never heard of before, too. And I was looking for a kind of um, similar thing with the last, uh, the Alien New World Order book that I read, where really didn't have a lot of references right it's just a whole lot of conclusions coming out of you know i i heard this one story this one narrative and let me just recount that narrative and add on to it you know no he's really using a lot of different sources okay um a sumerian text from 1960 bc at about the time Terah moved his family from ur to heron could well hold the initial key for it states the gods have abandoned us like migrating birds smoke lies on the city like a shroud uh, so here Sumeria Sumerian text so we're talking about cuneiform um, or cuneiform however you say it and 1960 BC and I'm thinking okay my initial thought was why aren't you comparing these to other texts that were written around the same time um, but this book is about lineage as it pertains to the bible so everything's kind of going back to the old testament so i so i began to appreciate his focus you know um okay let's see um such buildings are now known to have been typical of the great sumerian cities they were called ziggurats literally called towers rising to the sky more importantly they were designed as sacred mountains or hills of heaven so here he showed this one ziggurat and it's just a picture of what one was supposed to look like and I'm thinking, of course, about all the pyramids and all the artifacts and everything that exists in Egypt. But he's focusing on, focusing on Sumerian cities. And I'm like, where's all these cities? Where's all this proof of these cities? And if you got this whole civilization going on west of you, um, why are you still trying to put uh, origins in this small, small little area, right? Um, that was my thought there. Okay. 
Not only that, but a good deal of old documentation was still extant. Lawyers records, taxation records, mill owners records, shopkeepers records, educational records, medical records, even fashion house records, all in a unique Sumerian style of wedge-shaped cuneiform writing. Additionally, mathematical calculators were found, uh, including tables for extracting square and cube roots, and... Okay, so all of that... Uh, oh, as manifest in the mathematics of Euclid, who lived some 1700 years later. So again, I'm thinking this is like very... Uh, centered away from everything that is in Egypt and Africa, right? Like, you can say the same thing about all of that and then add on a freaking civilization. Add on everything else. But I'm like, okay, so you're just talking about records right now. You're just talking about, oh, look at what they wrote about this place that we can't see anywhere. We don't see this stuff, but but they wrote about it. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. They even discovered a kingly burial ground together with the documentary records and cultural treasures unsurpassed in all Egypt. <clears throat> uh, okay. Crimson robes and silver. Uh, let's see. Now, the guy who I got this from, he got notes hella through here. And it really kind of helped me understand where he was coming from a little more. I, I felt like <laughs> this is kind of the culmination of where his... Uh, what he really holds dear in his belief system and um some of the stuff i'm just like ah this this didn't prove it because some of the stuff in here i didn't know was going to be uh spoken that he's spoken about and i'm just like hmm i hear that mm, i don't believe it yet um but it might be some truth to it but it's not something i'm just gonna spout as undisputable fact uh okay it is generally agreed by scholars that there are two consecutive creation stories in the genesis okay here we go he starts critiquing tearing apart a lot of religion a, a lot of christianity in the old testament in ways that i have done probably internally and i've heard a few other people do but i've never i didn't expect it to come it, it blew me out okay so so two creation stories the first genesis 1 1 2 to 4 is considered to be the work of a priestly writer of the 6th century bc now some of these dates those are debatable right now uh, he gives dates to a lot of the books that you can't prove but um, that some have uh, some have said so even the fact that this was 1999 um, and it's been 20 years over 20 years I know that more has come out in regards to all of this information so that's another thing uh, that he alludes to later he got some really good stuff at the end oh just wait um, Let's see. The early Canaanite writings determined that Jehovah's nominal predecessor was the great El Elyon, Elyon, whose powers included the bestowing of lordship in consultation with the master craftsman. Oh, that wasn't my star. That was his. Okay. So that was the first story. Um, Genesis 1, 2 to 4. The second creation account, uh, Genesis 2, 5 to 25, has a somewhat older tradition, and its author is often called the Javis because... He introduced the godly name of Jehovah. Okay. Goes until Jehovah and they couldn't speak it and the roots of Jehovah. He gives a lot of um explanations for the words and the translations and he disputes translations of um uh, the original, you know, Hebrew or Arabic text and, and then it just he surprised me by the end. Because I thought, who is his audience? Who is he talking to? Who is he trying to prove something to? It, it, is it Christians? Is it uh, those Egyptologists who want to center everything on Africa? Is it uh, folks who don't believe in in religion? Like, who is he talking to, right? Students, scholars? Okay. So those are the questions that I was running through my mind. The various books existed only as individual texts as indicated by the 38 scrolls of 19 Old Testament books found at Qumran, Judea between 1947 and 1951. Um, these included a 23 foot Hebrew scroll of the book of Isaiah the longest of all the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, let's see this has been uh, since become known as the Septuagint uh, because 72 scholars were employed in the translation um, so th this was the first century form of the Old Testament uh, so 
lot of good history stuff. I'm like, well, I can't really dispute that, and I don't know why I would. I don't really care about a lot of this right now. I'm just like, this isn't. I'm not too excited about this. Okay, in the Sumerian language, a lush pasture land between irrigated areas was called an Eden. Among the most notable Edens of ancient times was the land of Eridu, about 16 miles southwest of Ur in the Euphrates Delta. So he, yeah, uh, the one word that he translates differently is like Kish, and he puts that in like uh, somewhere in like Mesopotamia as opposed to Kush in Africa, right? Um, so he's, what I felt like he was making a real concerted effort to, to discount everything African and put it all in Mesopotamia. That was my initial thought, okay? Um, thus, the first river did not encompass the land of Havila, but um, blah, blah, blah. The same, uh, the same applies to the second river said to be of Ethiopia, except that in this instance, the name of the place has been wrongly translated. Ethiopia is not mentioned at all in the original place. The place named is Kush. Um, when the Bible was translated, this was thought to refer to Kush, modern Sudan, in old Abyssinia, North Africa. But Ethiopia did not exist in such in the early days, being simply a name given to North Africa as a whole by the Greeks. The biblical Kush was actually Kush or Kish, east of Babylon. There you go. So that's what I was just talking about. Um, I love how I mention something and then I find it immediately after in the text. Okay, so the Chaldean Genesis. This is the Bible and Babel. Um, now he uses this text a lot. It's called Okay, the story known to the ancient Babylonians and Assyrians as the Anuma Elish in accordance with his opening words went on high. Okay, so that Enuma Elish he comes back to a lot. Um, and I'm pretty sure that is in a cuneiform, right? So yeah. Uh he has Marduk in here and this was in um Alien World Order. So that's when I was really starting to say, uh oh. But now I understand where it's coming from. So this was um this is coming from uh, a lot of the tablets and stuff written in Sumeria or Sumerians wrote it. Whatever. Uh and then he has a huge okay. Sumerian writing is still reckoned to be the oldest sophisticated form of writing in existence, having first appeared in about 3400 BC. Now that don't even make sense to me. That didn't even make sense. So you're saying it's the oldest sophisticated form of writing in existence, and that's 3400 BC. So at the same time that you can date a whole civilization, you're saying that this writing East was the first you know, I, I just, I was like, nah, bro. But um, I did try to think about, okay, let me put this in a modern context. You might have some really smart people, really just scholars. And let's say they live in like uh, Alabama, right? In a small little part of Alabama, you got these just scholars that come together and they write all this amazing stuff and they have this um, advanced way of thinking. Now that's separate from everything else that's going on in society. Um, they could have been the authors, designers. Well, let's use Silicon Valley, for example, right? So let's say like the whole nation is burnt to a crisp and then they find all this, all these documents on hard drives because apparently they were able to excavate and uh, find information on these hard drives. But anyway, um, and they find all this information in this one location, but it's separate from where the rest of the world kind of stood in its technology and science. I was like, well, I can see that that you got these um, geniuses in a small area that haven't really influenced the nation as a whole. And I mean, that's that's just trying to stretch it to make sense. But um, yeah, when he said that, I was like, come on, bro. Okay, the world's first truly civilized and advanced race were the Sumerians who emerged with a wholly new technological and academic culture soon after 4000 BC having their kingly and priestly empire firmly cemented by 3800 BC. Okay, huge statement. Where's the proof? Because uh, when I look with my eyes, I don't see that. <laughs> That's not what I see. Okay. Uh, okay. So, I was pretty turned off already. And this is just page, I'm at like page 60 right now, so I'm still way early. Um... 
as there is nothing spiritual or ethereal about the word angel in its Greek form the nephi of the definition agalos more usually transliterated as angelos or in Latin angelus was translated from the original he Hebrew malath which meant no more than messenger I thought it was interesting but I'm just like Okay, so is he a linguist? Does he know multiple languages? Where where is his uh, his um, expertise, right? Um, but yeah, couldn't find that. Didn't look too hard either, but I couldn't find the answer to that one. Um, let's see the twelve clay tablets recounting the epic of Gilgamesh, epic of Gilgamesh ruler of Uruk, was discovered among the the effects of King Ashurbanipal of Assyria, 669 to 626 BC at Nineveh. Um, I was like, oh yeah, I remember reading that. That's when I began to question the Bible, when I realized there was literally another text that talked about the flood. And this is before I knew anything about Egypt, anything about Book of the Dead, anything or the uh, Book of Coming Forth by Day, or um, any of the papyrus and just no idea. But I had heard about the Epic Gilgamesh and I was like, whoop. Throwing all this Christianity stuff in there. Um, let's see. Chapter 6 is the Age of Enlightenment. All right. Um, it appears that we descended from the Afro Asian Cro Magnon types, but that this species, but from what species did they evolve? Okay. And then he goes into um, mitochondrial DNA, the female inheritance passed down from mothers. Um, so he's kind of all over the place, but again, this is, uh, he's really trying to deal with lineage and descendants. He's trying to lay it down. So he's really laying a framework for that. And that, he didn't stray too far. Though some of the stuff I'm just like, are you just throwing in all this information? Cause I don't see how this supports a case you're trying to build. You're just throwing in a lot of stuff. And that's real distracting. Trying to follow a train of thought when a person just keeps throwing in a whole lot of random stuff, um, that's difficult. And that's another reason I like to um, do book reviews because rather than ranting and raving about anything, I like to follow the framework of something so I can get through it quick. Um, here perhaps with the primordial ancestors of the Iljo people who occupied the Afro-Asian regions around 35,000 BC when the sons of gods united with the daughters of men, a race which appeared as the new, more advanced Homo sapiens took over. Just throwing out that claim. I don't know how you're proving that. Um, so yeah, that continues. Like he has paragraphs upon paragraphs where there are no annotations. It's just him summing up stuff and you're just like, okay, well I guess I'm supposed to accept all that and keep going. Um, so I can understand why critics would say, you know, he was, uh, yeah, they just didn't try to discredit him in some ways. Okay. History is that which the governing establishments approve for their courses, and myth is everything else. So what governs approved history in Britain, Europe, and Christendom in general? To a large extent, it is governed by church doctrine, just like most other things. But what of the Muslims who in essence worship the same God their viewpoint according to the Christian establishment is a myth such is the arrogant nature of doctrinal education oh he started taking jabs I love that so history is that which the governing establishments approve for their courses and myth is everything else right there I was like whoop just when you were starting to lose me you pulled me right back in uh, let's see it is well known to all his uh, his, historical and theological scholars scholars that the Old Testament's book of Genesis was extracted from older Mesopotamian records. Genesis from Mesopotamian records. Why is it then that so many of these same scholars uphold the church's veneration of Genesis as an absolute truth, whereas they decry the original record as legend and mythology? It is because in the final analysis analysis despite falling congregations church opinion always wins at an official level since it is inherently tied to the governments which control the academic establishments come on man that's the kind of stuff you know like oh did he say that Ooh, yes he did um as we have seen so two things though 
he was mentioning it being from the Mesopotamian records. And I'm like, from everything I've read up to this point, why aren't you going back to Egypt and Africa? Egypt, commit. I mean, what? You know, um, but then when he critiques how the church and how the government collude, I was like, but hey, but you're right, man. But you're right. I see that. As we have seen, the ancient <clears throat> Sumerians were a very advanced race. They had schools, hospitals, lawyers, accountants, doctors, astronomers, and historians. The training of these professionals was expensive and time-consuming. The schools were strict and accuracy was everything. There it goes again. Okay, so the ancient Sumerians, very advanced race. Okay, so so you have a, a few advanced people, and meanwhile, you have an advanced civilization down the street. But you want to put more on these people. And what did they have? Let's say that again. Schools, hospitals. Okay. Take your word for it. What else do they got? Lawyers, accountants, doctors, astronomers, historians. Then they got positions. There ain't no cities. No huge monuments. No, uh, what were these astronomers doing? What was their work? I mean, what? it's, it's just... That wasn't a lot of proof there. Okay. <clears throat> oh, and that was my note there. But these are the very records which modern academia classifies as the legends of primitive people. Why? Because they do not conform to the accepted notions of a church society which rewrote the accounts and has then defined its own known mythology as history. So, so his uh, critique of the writers of history is, is great. But it's like, but you're talking about the Sumerians. I'm just not convinced, man. I'm just not convinced. Um, yeah. Not taking away, not to say that they couldn't have been concurrent, but obviously what was going on in Egypt was far superior. I mean, just look at the results. Something didn't work. You know the people from Sumar or wherever. They was going over there, right? So I, I was already thinking this. Like, even if you're real smart, if you have heard about the area you want to get over there because you're going to be around more production of this stuff and i mean it just made sense anyway let's keep going um seven i'm surprised it's taking this long but this book is kind of long i mean the actual text goes to 270 or something um but it goes pretty fast this pharaonic chronology is entirely dependent on the presumption that the standard biblical chronology is correct but the Bible chronology of Archbishop Usher in the Christian church is far from correct. Uh, when Sumerian history is concerned, we are looking at texts with much older roots than the earliest Egyptian records so far discovered. What? What? Now, granted, I do uh, understand that a lot of the stuff that was found goes from like the later dynasties. You know, um, so I get that. I get that. But still, you're dealing with text and you're dealing with civilization. And civilizations, as we see them, are preceded by a growth way before the stuff is cemented in a whole freaking pyramid and stele. And uh, I mean, they build up to that. So they're advanced for a longer period than the monuments can attest to. That's, that's just how humanity works. Um, okay years and years of planning okay he mentions this guy a lot sir charles leonard woolley um he discovered something but his, his, his name is he uses him a lot um i'm telling you though the end really got me okay descriptions of the project location specifically referred in the text of eden are given in the foundation cylinder and tablets of the lately dubbed karsag epic the epic of enclosure these were discovered at nipper in the late 19th century but were written around 2500 bc it is in this expansive work that the onaki reference first appears more specifically denoted at the stage of anunana the great sons of anu um that was important because he uh says that these anunaki were the the very first like or these were like the god beings that created the human beings like these were the best beings right um who migrated like birds later. And he comes back to that a lot too. Okay, uh, chapter eight, Lady of Life. The most complete and comprehensive version of the flood saga comes from the 12 Babylonian clay tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. 
They were found in the middle of the 19th century among the Nineveh Library ruins. Okay. <clears throat> Telling so much to skip in this one. <laughs> they had genetically engineered the semi advanced Homo sapiens once before. Oh, no, that was one of his notes. Um, yeah, but that's where he's just. He's saying without much proof that Homo sapiens were shaped. So the whole idea of like Genesis and the creator, we breathed life into man. That was them breathing themselves, their beings into their creation, the Homo sapiens sapien. Let me just shape these creatures. Um, so let us now look at the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic that was the inspirational source for Genesis. What is this ancient work? have to say on the matter um, so <laughs> I'm gonna just skip most of that <clears throat> um, he uses so many names ugh, that uh, are hard to read because I can't even say it in my head I'm like trying to figure out how to say it Nin Corsag's Nin Corsag's experiments were soon perfected and she was ready to create her utmost masterpiece Homo Sapiens Sapiens the Athrahasis epic records that Ia and Nin Igiku created 14 new humans soon after the flood, seven boys and seven girls. And the clinical process involved the wombs of women who had survived the deluge. So, uh, this is something he does throughout the book. So, on one hand, he's going to criticize these stories, and then he's going to say they mistranslated X, Y, and Z. And then on the other hand, he's going to accept what's written as fact. Like, based on this fact, then we can trace this back because it's written here. And at the same time, he critiques the same document. So it's like he's literally picking and choosing what to accept from stories and what to just disregard. You know, and that alone, like, how are you not going to just at least make mention of the fact that you're doing that? You know, um, but it also, oh, yeah, this is one thing I wanted to mention. It also makes me appreciate because his viewpoint is very different from a lot of scholars I've read and with them I saw them as being you know very Afrocentric right so they wouldn't discuss but I mean different caliber now because they would reference a lot more Greek Greek writers Romans I mean they would quote 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 to build a case right he uh so some people can, um, I kind of lost my train of thought. Basically, uh, it's good music though. Yeah. When the writers are so, uh, centered on a certain viewpoint, then that bias has to be acknowledged, right? So I can see how basically, and that's why this is like the last book before I really switch gears. Um, you can prove what you want to prove if you're a good writer and you're a good researcher you can prove whatever you want you can prove whatever you want all you gotta do is pick and choose because there's always more out there to read and to counter to have to um reconcile with but if you have enough sources people will think you've done all of your homework and you could still be omitting or only telling 40 percent of the story you know not even half of the story but your story is so extensive that it just has to be why dispute all that, right? Um, so I can see the same thing with African-centered as well as this Sumerian-centered. And it took this to see the African literature in that similar context. Okay. <laughs> oh, but it gets better. Let me tell you. Uh, he's talking about the Tower of Babel. Uh, nothing on that. ba -da -da. To complete the vindictive punishment, God said to Eve, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. He also said to Adam that, having eaten once from the tree, in sorrow thou shalt eat. Um, don't know why I started that, but yeah. The chapter on the tree of knowledge was pretty interesting. And he even puts the uh, the stuff about the serpent. Um, okay, this was, this was real good. It's coming. What are we to make of all this? Does it relate in any way to the Mesopotamian record upon um, which the Bible story was based? It does in a rather vague manner, but first we must consider the nature of the serpent whose presence has been thoroughly misrepresented for centuries. Um, 
Moving down from the earliest times, the serpent was identified with wisdom and healing. It was a sacred emblem of the Egyptian pharaohs, a symbol of the essence therapeutate, the ascetic healing community. Um, the serpent has never had any dark or sinister connotation, except for that imposed on the Genesis text by Latter-day Church doctrines. Um, so one, I was like, oh, he's giving a little credit to Egypt now. Interesting. Because how does that play out when you're talking about these texts being... Uh... Anyway, so gives them some credit regarding some texts, but then discredits their... Um, place in history so i was just like i just don't know man you're going back and forth on this what do you trust um but that duality was crazy i think he mentions it again i hope so um he just talks about the dualism let's see nowhere in the genesis account is there any mention direct or indirect of satan's involvement and yet it has become common practice for the church to portray the to portray the serpent as an emissary of satan as in yeah, or even as Satan himself. This has been done in an attempt to support the church's self styled concept of Eve's original sin, a concept developed and promoted by St. Augustine, which, like so many doctrines of the early bishops, emerged from an unhealthy sexual paranoia. Man, that was some jabs. I was like, mm, I hear you. Um, but there's more. Let's see. <clears throat> this Satan character was an invention of the post Jesus era, a fabulous myth with no more holistic worth, no more historic worth than any figment of a gothic novel. Um, okay, here we go. No, that's not it. The sinister satanic. No, that's not it. Um, here we go. Today, the Isaiah verse in authorized Christian Bibles retains the Latinized Lucifer entry which emanated from the Christian church's creation of its own Satan mythology during Roman imperial times. The Roman faith was based wholly on subjugating people at large to the dominion of the bishops and to facilitate this subordination and to facilitate this subordination an anti-God, anti-Christ figure was necessary as a perceived enemy. This enemy was said to be Satan, the evil one who could claim the souls of any who did not offer absolute obedience to the church. There was one other thing. Now, here he lists a lot of other texts, by the way. Uh, the Book of Adam and Eve, subtitled The Conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan. Um, the Book of the Cave of Treasures. Um, and he's talking about how it was in regards to Satan and this whole like, tree of knowledge myth. Um, let's see. Oh, check this out. Uh, it is claimed that when God said, let us go down, he was referring to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, a concept not established until the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. All right. I mean, he's really hidden. So I'm like, on the one hand, you are critiquing all of this uh, doctrine that the church has, but you're still trying to prove lineage in this same Old Testament. So again, I'm just like, who are you trying to talk to? Who are you trying to convince? People who believe the faith? Um, people who are following? Or what? But I couldn't disagree with everything he was saying. It was just, yeah. I definitely was kind of picking and choosing. Like, nope, not going to accept that. Um, let's see. Along with linguists such as Professor Robert Alter, the addicts of the Ha Kabbalah have traditionally maintained that our conventional understanding of biblical stricture, biblical strict scripture is a gross corruption of the original writings. Teaching and translations have been structured to conform with customs, beliefs, and politics of the times when taught or translated. Okay, so again, but he's trying to use these same texts to, uh, right? Okay, said it before. Let's keep going. It gets good. Oh, alchemy. It's about alchemy now, right? Alchemy is defined as the science which overcomes the blackness. Hadn't heard of that one. Or that which enlightens through intuitive perception. 
and his note on this one was not a thing. <laughs> um, of course, alchemy, I'll commit, commit land of the, yeah, okay. Um, he talks about the letter Q derives from the Venus symbol, which was equally attributed to Isis, Nin, Korsag, Lilith, and Kali, all of whom were deemed black, but beautiful. <clears throat> and this is coming from Song of Solomon 1 and 5. When I read that, I said, hold up, because that sound racist is all get out. Let me go to Song of Solomon. Sure enough, she was like, I am dark but lo lovely or something like that. But I'm like, black but beautiful back then? That really fast forwards when the text would have been written in my mind back when they wanted to distinguish. Um, so, anyway. And he comes back to that again, which I didn't understand. Like, this book really doesn't deal much with uh, black and white race, but with Egyptians. So, uh, it speaks more about the people that are in Africa without even probably saying much Africa at all, and the people in Sumer, Sumeria, and all that. Um... Almost done. In erstwhile Mesopotamian, Canaanite, and Egyptian thought, the unexplainable divine was manifest with nature, and nature enveloped both the gods and society. This belief, however, was shattered for all time by the biblical heroes who forsook harmony in favor of subservience. Uh, hence, the balance of the relationship between humankind and the phenomenal world was destroyed, and what was ultimately lost was integrity my god that to me was one of the biggest things i felt like he just spoke for me right then that that separation was uh that's exactly what happened that that was a lovely part um he said um as far as abraham and his descendants were concerned the power of enlil was to be feared beyond measure and the concept of this power became so awesome that it was said to transcend all things material and immaterial no longer this is one of my favorite quotes no longer was god seen to exist within nature it was thenceforth held that god had created nature um, but it on but on jesus's mission was one of equality balance and harmony the prerequisites of a unified and spiritually fertile society but his ambition was not to be fulfilled in the event it was overcome by ancient sectarian dogma of individual subjugation so that people were left contained in a sterile wasteland of uncertainty to this day the messianic dream prevails in the allegory of grail lore which contends that only when the wound of the fisher king is healed will the wasteland return to fertility um okay and then it, he, he really starts going down another rabbit hole and i'm just like it's almost kind of like ranting but uh, uh he, he kind of stays true to the subject of the chapter but it's just it's kind of everywhere <clears throat> heritage of the wasteland a faith of fear um nothing here uh let's see the unnamed god of modern christianity evolved through imperial Invention. He is certainly not the God of Jesus, for this God was a sublime disciple of self-awareness that dwells within everyone and needs no bridge-building pointif to lay down the rules of access. All right, and again, these were some of the. So this is the thick of it. When I was really enjoying some of the things he was saying, like this: if any if any religion has truly corrupted the original concept of Jehovah and, and the pantheon then that religion is materialist Christianity. This is not the honest first century Nazarene faith of Jesus, James and the Celtic church, but the state religion contri contrived by a Roman imperialist in the fourth century from which there are now many competitive offshoots. This hybrid cult not only brought a new awesome omnipotent omnipresent God to the fore, but it gave him self-styled personal representatives on earth. First the emperors and then the popes who thrived on being the ultimate bridges to individual salvation man come on so i'm again i'll say this one last time so i was thinking he was trying to make a case for the church in some way in trying to prove their lineage 
But with all of this, I was like, he is just ripping it apart. He is just completely ripping it up. Got to be offending a lot of people. Lilith was a paradox, being both spiritually dark and light, black but beautiful. Quote. Uh, he talks a lot about dragons. All right, gold of the guy. So then he goes into this whole thing about um, the powder, the white powder, how you were like grinding down this metals, the gold, uh, how it works with the pineal gland and the pituitary gland and how it's bringing you to this higher state of consciousness. And this is what the pyramids were used for, the, the great pyramids. And this was what the temple was used for in um, Samaria. Uh, and they found it and, and there were tests done in the U.S. where things would disappear into a different dimension and come back. And that's why you don't find bodies in the Great Pyramids because they were taken to a different dimension. Um, yeah, he throws out that in. And he uses the snakes without giving a whole lot of credit to Egypt just yet. So let's fast forward to the end. Um, to recap on the foregoing chapters, we have seen that Adam and Eve jointly called the Adame Earthlings were clinically created by Enki and Ninkurid through Enki's fertilization of human ova at the house of Shimti as detailed in the Sumerian records. So that's his interpretation of Sumerian. So, okay. As a result, their Anunnaki blood was further heightened. Atun succeeded his father as the king of Kish. 3500 BC so he does this whole thing where now he's saying like Moses was king like Akhenaten I want to say um, and he's he's pushing the lineage of the Sumerians and saying that they are going into Egypt in those later dynasties and he's like so this queen was Moses's mom and uh, so now the Egyptians are really the descendants and the uh, family cousins and you know of the Sumerians so yeah I mean that's that's what he does um, all right pineal gland we're on the Phoenix and the Firestone and all this stuff with the uh, monatomic gold um, all right white powder brother brotherhood so, okay, he shows this one. I wanted to show this 5,000 year old Electrum Gold Sumerian helmet. Oh, look at that amazingly advanced civilization because they got a helmet. Anything else? Okay. Um, golden headdress. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a headdress too. Um, yeah, so it's just like, come on now. Just look at in Africa and then let's compare apples <laughs> to seeds I, I, I don't know okay let's let's go forward um, chapter 15 the Vulcan and the pentagram not a lot there um, okay this Egyptian connection was not welcomed by the Hebrew scribes because they saw it to portray a clean patriarchal line that did not incorporate the matriarchal legacy of the dragon queens as a result okay uh, I'm telling you it was uh, wasn't feeling that too much he does a little bit with the with the uh, five pointed star it just felt out of place some of this stuff just didn't mm, but I did feel like I got a good geography lesson because he speaks so much about these places um in depth that I see them a little clearer because I've tried to stay out of um, Middle Eastern politics and all that stuff as much as was necessary. Like if it's not my business, I'm not gonna make it my business. If it's not relating to anything that I'm studying, then I'm not gonna study it. Uh, and finally, it, it just really came up because I've been trying to stay away from like Bible stuff for a while, but this was a great conclusion. Um, let's see. And at one point when I was reading, I was like, now this would be a good Bible study. If somebody like this came into the Bible study, and it was like five or six of these people who were actually studying, <laughs> not just the Bible, but other texts that didn't make the canon, uh, 
So that's another thing he does. He mentions a lot of the books and he quotes from them um, that didn't make the book, but for instance, spoke about Miriam, um, the book of uh, Jassar, or Jasser, I think that's the name of it. Um, let's see. I'm probably about to just run across it now. Oh yeah, here's one thing I wanted to mention. So one awesome thing is that he was saying, let me just read it. Okay. <clears throat> It was not until 1822 that the hieroglyphic code was broken by the French Egyptologist Jean-Francois Champollion, achieved by the uh, now famous Rosetta Stone, found near Alexandria in 1799. Okay. Um, ultimately, we have a conjectural form of standard mean chronology, which is generally used in textbooks today, but this is largely based upon the 17th century biblical dating structure compiled by Archbishop Usher of Argma. Um, since the majority of Usher's reckoning is inaccurate, it follows that the Egyptian dates calculated from his framework are similarly incorrect. Um, well, that wasn't the big part. What he was really, uh, what excited me was when he was talking about uh, how all of the recent discoveries in Egypt um, date to basically like the early 20th century and because of these new discoveries there's a big learning curve to finally getting that information into our understanding because it disproves a lot of stuff it disproves a lot of things that were strongly held beliefs and facts up until their discovery and once you acknowledge those discoveries and put them in the proper context it completely changes the historical narrative <clears throat> and so people have been slow to accept it but um when he made that point i was just like that's what it is it's just ignorance but it's because the information is so recent relatively recent and that's not something i consider i just consider people being um uh, willfully ignorant just not wanting to accept the facts but we didn't willfully choose the information most of the information that we grow up learning right so it's not necessarily willful ignorance. It's just a slow learning curve to for this information to be put out, and for, and for people to then have that in their minds to uh, shape the world that they see. <clears throat> okay, um, and I'm probably going to run across that passage now, but uh, let's see. The duration of the Israelite sojourn in Egypt is confirmed to the nope, 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 nope. Of the time that the Israelites spent in Egypt was 430 years. Okay. He talks about that and he puts in these dates. I don't care about it right now. Um, the book of Genesis concludes with the death of Joseph and his embalming and burial in Egypt. Okay, so here we go when he's like bringing everything into Egypt. <clears throat> and I'm just going to fast forward. Let's go to Magico on the mountain. Um, Magico on the mountain. Oh, we'll skip all that too. Uh, talking about Miriam. Wasn't a whole lot. Okay. Even the ritualistic use of the name of the previous Egyptian state god, Amen, was retained by the Israelites. He was the god of Moses' father, Amenhotep, meaning Amen is pleased, and the name Amen or Amun originally meant hidden. It was added to the end of papyrus to denote that they were prayers to Amen and blah, blah, blah. So here he is going back, and now he's showing his knowledge of um, Egyptology, I guess you could say, which was crazy, man. Okay, anyway. And I mean, he even puts the Ten Commandments on him. Like, you know, here the Christian church is trying to say that, you know, Moses stood on the mountaintop and got these plates, which look more like tombstones, and he got these Ten Commandments when there's no acknowledgement that these things were written in the book of the dead oh he even puts the i mean <clears throat> which ones um like 125 or something oh i wish i could find that quote so yeah he does that over and over again just like we now have all this information from all these temples all this papyri so why aren't we correcting what we know is straight up false that uh what was written in the Bible 
um, was predated by what was in Egypt. So anyway, uh, that was pretty much it. No huge revelations, but I, I enjoyed the book. So I'm, I'm switching gears. Um, I'm excited about the uh, books to come. I'm going to start with uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. So that's the next book. And uh, keep reading, and I hope you enjoy it. Latest.